Defending Israel with David Harris on JBS is made possible in part by a generous gift in memory of Eric and Mira J. Spector, the Paul and Lynn Late Family Foundation to Life to Love, Barbara and Bob Goodkind, the Patricia Worthen Ullman Foundation, Hello, JBS viewers. I'm David Harris, and this is Defending Israel. On November the 5th, Americans went to the polls, and we have the results. Donald Trump won decisively. The Republicans captured the Senate, and it looks like they will capture the House by a narrow margin as well. And whether you voted for Donald Trump or not, whether you're happy with the results or not, we're all Americans. We're all Jews. We care about our country. We care about Israel. We care about the fight against anti-Semitism. And it's really important that we understand what's the meaning of this election and what might we expect over the next four years. And so I'm pleased to introduce you, maybe some of you have seen him on cable news before, to Sam Markstein, who is the spokesman and the political director for the Republican Jewish Coalition. Sam, welcome to Defending Israel. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Sam, before we plunge into the election and its meaning, uh, maybe a word about yourself. Introduce yourself to our viewers, please. Sure. Well, I've been with the Republican Jewish Coalition for about five years now. Uh, before that, I was a campaign kid. I worked on political campaigns, the national uh, federal and a state level across some different states in the Northeast. You've probably heard of a few of them uh, in the past couple of years. Uh, and before that, uh, I was uh, an undergrad at uh, Johns Hopkins, and I just recently finished uh, law school down here in D.C. at uh, Georgetown. And so the last couple of years, I've been spending my time uh, working with the RJC to continue to make inroads with the American Jewish community to move more of them into the Republican tent and to continue to fight for a strong uh, Israel-U.S. relationship here at home uh, and in the international bodies and in the press and in the media and places that really matter uh, as we continue to see significant spikes in anti-Semitism here at home and uh, obviously the ongoing war uh, overseas. Sam, talk a, a bit about your own political journey. Were you always a Republican from birth or did you have more of a zigzag uh, journey? Um, and tell us a little bit about the Republican Jewish Coalition for those viewers who may be hearing about it for the first time. So I cast my first ballot uh, for president uh, for uh, Governor Romney in 2012. Uh, I remember doing that uh, proudly at, at the time. Uh, I remember uh, going to the polling booth. So I've always been a Republican uh, from day one. Uh, my family doesn't always agree with that, uh, which makes for some fun conversations around uh, Thanksgiving or, or the Seder table or what have you. Uh, but I always had fun uh, enjoying those cross-examinations at home, which I think, frankly, prepared me really well uh, for having these conversations uh, in public opinion as well. Uh, but for the RJC, uh, we've been around since the 1980s. Uh, we are the preeminent organization uh, for Jewish Republicans in the United States. We've got over 100,000 members nationwide, and we really serve as the unique bridge between Republican decision makers and the American Jewish community. So we provide a Republican voice in the Jewish community and also provide a Jewish perspective within the Republican Party. And we really have gotten a lot of exposure uh, in the last year or so. We were invited by the uh, Republican Party, the RNC, uh, last November to co-host a national presidential debate in Miami, which was the first time any Jewish organization on either side of the aisle had been offered to co-host a national presidential debate. And then when we got to Milwaukee for the national convention uh, this past July, our CEO, Matt Brooks, was invited to deliver a keynote speech uh, from the main stage at Pfizer Forum. So the RNC and the Republican Party have really leaned in uh, to supporting Jewish voices, to elevating and championing Jewish Americans in this election cycle. And we hope and expect that that will continue long into the future uh, as more American Jews 
vote Republican. And as uh, these conversations continue and as the stakes continue uh, to be as high as they are, uh, which is uh, where we are today. Sam, let's focus now on November the 5th. Uh, th there are lots of numbers out there. From the perspective of the RJC, the Republican Jewish Coalition, what are the numbers you're using in terms of Jewish voting behavior? And within that question, were there any surprises, good or bad? Uh, any lessons learned that might be applied to future elections? Delve into those numbers a bit with us. Sure. This is a great question. Um, so we rely on a bunch of different things to kind of analyze where we stand uh, with the Jewish American electorate. And as you said, November 5th was a historic election. And for those uh, who care about Israel, who are in favor of a strong U.S.-Israel relationship, uh, frankly, this was a life-saving election in the sense that now with Donald Trump in the White House, with a Republican-led Senate, and with a Republican-led House, uh, um, Jewish Americans and pro-Israel voters can rest assured that the United States will stand unequivocally, unapologetically, ironclad with Israel, with the Jewish community, as we face some of our darkest days in modern Jewish history. And so when we delve into the data, uh, this most recent cycle represented the largest share of the Jewish vote going for a Republican for president since the 1980s. You have to go all the way back to 1988, I believe, when Michael, Duta Michael Dukakis to see a Democrat and Kamala Harris have performed as poorly uh, nationally with the Jewish community. And the numbers get even uh, it more interesting when you delve into the battleground states where it actually determines the presidency because we love uh, Jewish Americans who vote in New York and Illinois and California, but those Jewish American voters really don't matter quite as much or factor in quite as much to the Electoral College as Jewish voters in places like, you know, Arizona, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Michigan. And so that's the place that we spent uh, the most of our collective efforts. We embarked on a $15 million campaign, which is the largest investment ever in the Jewish community to turn out the Jewish vote for President Trump and Republican candidates down ballot. This involved excuse me, everything from sophisticated investments in data operations and modeling, which allowed us to hyper-target and micro-target Jewish American voters across these different battleground states. So back in the day, just a couple of cycles ago, when folks would actually aggregate uh, Jewish voter files, it really was based mostly on last names, which was really, really ineffective and really non-targeted. So when you'd go to 100 doors, let's say, to go knock on those, maybe 10 or 20 of them were actually Jewish voters. Now when we do it, about 80 or 90 of them are Jewish voters. So we've really increased and improved our data efficiency, which allows us to really target folks where they are, deliver a message that affects them the, the, the greatest, and actually turn them out on election day. And so we've been going through precinct by precinct, which is not the sexiest part of politics, but it really is where you kind of see these results. And on the precinct to precinct, municipality to municipality level, in some of these key voting areas across these battlegrounds, we saw significant shifts going to President Trump and Republicans. So I'll just give you one example. Uh, in Pennsylvania, in Montgomery County, uh, this is a county that had gone for Kamala Harris overwhelming, uh, excuse me, Joe Biden in 2020 overwhelmingly uh, not that long ago, and we saw a significant move to President Trump in some of these key suburban uh, Jewish-heavy uh, towns. And so you look at the exit polls for another example, Donald Trump got about 25% uh, of the Jewish vote in Pennsylvania in 2020. He got roughly 40% of the Jewish vote in Pennsylvania in 2024. So that's not to say that he got you know, 40 exactly or around that, but the, the idea is that you're seeing the shift, you're seeing the trend lines move. And now folks can argue over what the exact number is, but there's no doubt that there was a movement towards Republicans in this election within the Jewish community, and that helped to deliver the president presidency for President Trump as part of his winning coalition. And I know that, as you said, New York was not a, a, as key because it was in a way predetermined, many believed. But I saw one survey that said as many as 43 percent of Jews in New York state voted for Donald Trump. Is, is that accurate according to your data? That, yes, and that would represent a historic share of the Jewish vote, but it's also very in line with what we saw with Congressman Lee Zeldin when he ran for governor just two years ago. He got roughly about the same, 40, 45 percent of the New York Jewish vote. And just to, for your viewers, just to give you some perspective on how much of a shift in New York there was, Donald Trump came closer to winning New York State than Kamala Harris did to winning Florida. 
And I think that that really encapsulates the movement that you saw, not just in the Jewish community, but a lot of, a lot of these urban areas that were fed up with crime, they were fed up with the migrant crisis, they were fed up with the spikes in anti-Semitism, they were fed up with the cost of living and inflation. So all these different factors came together in a really powerful way, and these are the results that you're seeing across the board. So, uh, Sam, since, since you're now able to break down data in a way that was not possible some years ago, what more can you reveal about Jewish voting behavior? For example, and this is just impressionistic, obviously, you, you have the data. Uh, in Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox communities, uh, my impression is that there was a, a, a very heavy turnout for Donald Trump. Um, in Russian-speaking communities, uh, the same. In the Iranian and Syrian communities in New York and, and Los Angeles, for example, that's impressionistic, that's anecdotal, that's from a number of conversations. But are you able to break down Jewish voting behavior more specifically than 40% or 43%? Um, where is the strength and where is the weakness for the Republican Party? Well, as you just suggested, the strength of the Republican Party in the Jewish community, no surprise, is the Orthodox community, uh, which is honestly the fastest growing uh, part uh, of the Jewish community and will you know, continue to grow at a much faster pace than the rest of the different denominations. But I think a really good uh, anecdote, uh, one, one anecdote at least, to kind of give you a sense of where we saw the campaign entering the final few weeks was that the Harris campaign was dispatching surrogates like Richie Torres and Dan Goldman to reform synagogues um, in Atlanta and Philly and other places. And so that told us that they were really in trouble because generally speaking, when you're on a campaign, in the last few weeks, you're on offense. You're playing in places where you don't normally do well. So you had Donald Trump coming to the Bronx and Madison Square Garden in New Mexico. Where was Kamala Harris and her surrogates? They were trying to shore up the base of the Democratic Party, which I think tells a lot of the story, which is that they did not feel that the base was really there with them, that Jewish Americans, reformed Jewish Americans, were really having second, uh, second thoughts and questions and doubts about whether they could trust her and the Democratic Party to actually stand with them and, and deliver on what they've been promising for the last few years. And so I think, excuse me, on the data side of things, this cuts across the board, whether it was Orthodox community, conservative community, reform community and anybody in between, we saw shifts in the communities. So ex another example, and um, I actually went out to a whole host of different states over the course of this election. I traveled to uh, Michigan and, and Georgia and Pennsylvania and Nevada and Arizona. I was all over the place. And pr uh, just from my own experience with our staff who was on the ground and who were fantastic through this entire operation, we had staff and volunteers across the board, thousands of volunteers doing door knocks and making phone calls and letters to the editor and text banks and all the rest, um, when we would go out into these conservative communities in Michigan, for example, in like Bloomfield Township or Bloomfield Hills, these are precincts that would have gone for Joe Biden about two to one, 66 to 33 percent. We looked into it uh, the other day and it's almost 50-50. Um, so there really was a shift, and these are not Orthodox communities, these are more conservative Jewish communities, reformed Jewish communities, and even amongst those folks we saw a shift as well. So yes, the Orthodox community definitely uh, has been and will be a strong base of support for the Republican Party and was for Donald Trump, but I think you saw a, a significant hemorrhage in support uh, for the Democrat uh, this year, including a lot of undervoting, I might add. So folks that went in and chose not to vote for president but might have voted for Alyssa Slotkin or might have voted for uh, Bob Casey or some of the other Democrats that, uh, that ran. Uh, so Sam, uh, look, we, we both know, our viewers know, that there's a group of people who are ecstatic and elated, and there's a group of people in the Jewish community who are deeply worried for a whole host of reasons. So let's tackle some of their concerns and offer them, to the extent that you're, you want, you're able, uh, a, a, Reassurance. Uh, there are those who believe that uh, Donald Trump in Charlottesville um, took the good people on both sides, and they still believe that that's what he said and that's what he meant. They refer to the dinner with Nick Fuentes and Kanye West and ask how could a president or former president sit with two people who are known to be anti-Semitic uh, they're worried about his 
neo-isolationism. America First has, has memories of the 1930s, Charles Lindbergh. Uh, talk to those concerns and don't dismiss them with, you know, with kind of standard talking points, but these are concerns that are well, real. I, I wasn't planning to, yes. Good. And so I'll, ta Good. I'll take the last one first. And so for those that are concerned about uh, neo-isolationism and, and that strain in the Republican Party, it's certainly a conversation that we're having. Uh, it's certainly a fight that we on the Republican Jewish Coalition side of things intend to win. And I think that okay. just the, in the last couple of days, uh, this point has been very made clear, whether it's Elise Stefanik as the United Nations ambassador, whether it's Mike Waltz uh, as the national security advisor, or as it's being reported, uh, Senator Rubio as the secretary of state, this is by far unequivocally and unapologetically the most pro-Israel uh, lineup that you could possibly dream up. So that, that's number one, and I expect more of the picks to be in the same vein, whether it's for Department of Defense or other key positions in the Trump administration. On the second point about um, Nick Fuentes uh, and the anti-Semites, if you recall in this election cycle, uh, Nick Fuentes and David Duke and other avowed anti-Semites who are you know scum of the earth, they decided uh, that they had had enough of Donald Trump and they actually endorsed Jill Stein or told their followers not to vote for Donald Trump. And that's because, according to them, he was too pro-Israel and too good for the Jews. And I think that that tracks with the fact that he had a four-year record of accomplishment to look back on. And I really do think that anyone that thinks that Donald Trump is an anti-Semite has really fallen off the deep end in the sense that this is a, this is a president, a gentleman, who has Jewish children. He has Jewish grandchildren. He's appointing Jews to his cabinet. He is the first president to pray at the Western Wall. He just went the other week before the election to pray at the Chabad uh, Ohel of Menachem Schneerson. I mean, if he's Hitler, he's doing a really bad job because, um, you know, everything he's done, everything he is, speaks to the opposite of that. So I really think it was a lot of fear-mongering, electioneering, which I understand from a political perspective, as, as rough as that is. I'm from New Jersey originally, so uh, <laughs> I understand tough campaigns. Uh, but I really think it was beyond the pale to call him a fascist, to call him a Nazi, to call his supporters garbage and, you know, Nazis and fascists and all that. And I mean, you had at this rally at Madison Square Garden, which everybody on the on the left panned as, you know, some Nazi rally and tried to equate it to the rally in the 30s. Uh, you had Holocaust survivors at that rally. You had proud Jewish Americans at that rally. You had American Jews wrapping to fill in at that rally. I mean, if you really want to get into it, at the Democratic convention in Chicago, you had Jewish Americans literally running and hiding from pogroms, from Hamasniks who were on the streets terrorizing people. You didn't have that at the RNC convention in Milwaukee. So I think if they want to have that argument, it really doesn't play well for them and I think really exposes them for, for the fraudulent uh, tax that they were. And clearly it didn't work because you actually had more Jews support him than last time. And going back to the first point, uh, last, uh, for Charlottesville, I do think that this has been debunked. Um, he's condemned white nationalism and white supremacy. If you watch the full clip of it, he does condemn it before he makes the comment that they love to reference so much. So I think overall, uh, the folks that are really you know freaking out about this were not in it for the right reasons. They were not in it to try and actually um, convince people. They were trying to scare people. Um, and they failed, epically, uh, and in record and historic numbers. And so to continue with the concerns for just another moment, Sam, those who worry about Tucker Carlson's role, especially in light of his recent show where he seemed to debunk Churchill and that side of World War II history, or who are concerned that Candace Owens may show up in a new administration. What can you tell those viewers? I can tell those viewers that those folks are misguided and their idea of America first is not our idea of America first. They don't understand that 85 cents of every dollar that goes to Israel in foreign aid actually gets spent back here in the United States and as of 2028, 100% of every dollar sent to Israel will be spent here in the United States. So I think there's some, certainly some tough disagreements that we're going to have and it's going to be a family argument that we will have, but we intend to win that argument. We intend to continue to push for a strong America, for an America that believes in alliances. America first does not mean America alone. 
uh, and we've seen how important our allies are, and we expect that from our leaders. And so, like I said, this, this is a conversation that's going to continue to happen, but we intend to win that, and we have uh, up to now. Okay, so we have a few minutes left, and I want to look forward. From your yeah. perspective, from the perspective of the Republican Jewish Coalition, what would you like to see the new administration do, do differently? Number one, on the issue of surging anti-Semitism in the United States. And number two, addressing Israel's current, I'll call it existential war, and looking beyond what would you hope to achieve as in the first Trump administration, the transfer of the embassy to Jerusalem, the recognition of the Golan, and of course, most importantly of all, the Abraham Accords. So what's the next vision? Yeah, I mean, there, there's so much work to be done here, right? And I think that's part of why you had so many Jewish Americans vote Republican this year, is that um, the anti-Semitism is totally out of control. I mean, I think the ADL estimates a three to 400% increase mm -hmm. in anti-Semitic incidents. Uh, before the election, there were polls done that suggested that nearly half of American Jews were afraid to wear religious symbols in public. Nearly half of Jewish college students were afraid to tell their classmates that they were Jewish. So this was a really visceral, deeply personal, issue that was affecting in front of mind for a lot of Jewish American voters. And so I think when it comes down to it, uh, the days of impunity for uh, pro-terrorist sympathizers are over. If you're here on a student visa and you go out on the streets and say, I stand with Hamas, you should be deported. If there are um, universities and administrators that don't take seriously the surge in anti-Semitism on their campuses, they should lose federal funding if they refuse to protect their Jewish students. And you saw this in the first Trump administration with an expansion of Title VI protections that allows Jewish students to sue for civil rights violations. And so I think that's a good place to start, and there's a lot more I can get into on that if we have time. But on the uh, Israel side of things, on the war, Abraham Accords, of course, we'd love to see an expansion of the circle of peace in the region. I think there's an appetite clearly out there to make peace with Saudi Arabia and a few of the other big countries that could make a significant difference in security for the Jewish state. But I think the main thing here and what you have not seen for the last four years is maximum pressure on Iran. I mean, just the other week you had individuals here in the America arrested for attempting to assassinate uh, Donald Trump. And so I think, you know, this is a regime that is obviously hell-bent on destroying Israel, destroying America. When they say death to America, death to Israel, they mean it. Uh, and they've proved that they mean it. They've launched unprecedented numbers of attacks, not just on Israel through their proxies and directly from themselves, but also on American interests and allies and, and our bases and the rest uh, in the region. And so the Iranian regime, just like in the Trump administration, needs to be isolated bankrupted and anyone that does business with them, including buying their oil, needs to be sanctioned. We expect uh, the Trump administration to really clamp down on the head of the snake here, which is the terrorists in Tehran. And that is something that has been woefully um, short here in D.C. for the last four years with Biden and Harris, which has been nothing but weakness and appeasement. And you've seen the results, tragic results. And I know the other side likes to point to a few things here or there, but the posture needs to be that we stand shoulder to shoulder, no daylight between us and the Jewish state. And that's how you secure peace and prosperity for the region. So we, we still have three minutes. <laughs> Um, so I want to return to your invitation if we had more time uh, on the subject of anti-Semitism. So, yep. f Sam, for argument's sake, um, you and your colleagues, including my friend Matt Brooks, the director of the Republican Jewish Coalition. By the way, viewers, when I say my friend, I say it as a lifelong nonpartisan and political independent who believes we need to have friends in both parties because at the end of the day, we're one Jewish community and one America. So I just want to make that clear. But you, Matt, and your colleagues have a little time with the president-elect. He invites you to come to Mar-a-Lago. And he says, gentlemen, tell me the top three things in your mind that you want me to know going into my new term as president of the United States. What would those three things be? Again, you've covered a lot of ground here, but zero in now. I would say that, number one, college administrators and the university presidents uh, did not take the Democrats seriously, and that you need to make an example of some of these schools 
to show them that you mean business when they refuse to protect their Jewish students. I remember not that long ago, we, there was a report that came out where uh, disgracefully, frankly, um, the university presidents were asking Chuck Schumer for advice on how to handle these protests, and him and his staff told them to quote unquote, keep their heads down. This is only a Republican problem. So if you keep your heads down, you, know, you won't have any issue from the Democrats. I think that that is a big red flag, a big issue, uh, that we need to address, and Donald Trump would tackle that. I think number two is we need to ramp up the sanctions and restore maximum pressure on Iran. There's no question that they are the head of the snake. They are the largest state sponsor of terrorism in the world. Um, it's totally unacceptable, and, and frankly, uh, the fact that there were assassination plots and attempts on the president's life is totally unacceptable, and you heard crickets from the Biden administration uh, to hold them accountable for that. I mean, if, if somebody had threatened uh, J uh, Donald Trump when he was president and, and nobody said anything about that then, I think it would have been a totally different reaction to that. And then uh, third and finally, I would say, you know, go out there and continue to do more events with the American Jewish community. Over the last uh, couple of months of the campaign, Donald Trump did six uh, anti-Semitism roundtables specifically geared to the American Jewish community. Kamala Harris did zero. And I think that that really uh, showed people uh, where her priorities were or weren't, and I think played into a lot of why folks felt like they didn't have a political home. And so I would say to him, keep the pedal on the, keep the pedal to the metal, foot on the, foot on the gas, no brakes as far as standing with the Jewish community, continue to do what you're doing, and you'll continue to make inroads. Sam, thanks so much. And if the president or the new secretary of state gives you a couple of extra minutes, I would add, Zero in on Qatar. Don't let them continue to play both sides of the table as they have, including their funding of American universities, which ISCAP has been documenting for quite some time. Um, insist that Turkey not be allowed to play a double game. On the one hand, NATO member. On the other hand, Hamas supporter. And reinstate the Houthis on the U.S. terrorism list, which unfortunately they were removed from just a couple of years ago. I wish we had more time. I, I greatly appreciate it. And viewers, again, the way I started, some of you are happy, some of you are concerned. I hope in listening with open minds and open ears to Sam Markstein, you get a better sense of what awaits the next four years. And we'll continue to have these conversations, monitor and discuss. Sam, thanks for joining us on Defending Israel. Thanks for having me. Great conversation. Thanks, David. Thank you. And viewers, I look forward to seeing you next week. Meanwhile, this is David Harris defending Israel. JBS is made possible by viewers like you. This high holiday season, as a thank you for your tax-deductible support of our programming, you can request a signed copy of David Harris's new book, On the Front Lines. Simply visit our website for details. We thank you for your kind support.